This is Galatians 5, 19 through 26. Now the works of the flesh are evident. Sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. I warn you, as I warned you before, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also walk by the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking one another, envying one another. Lord God, I ask as uh, uh, Dr. Lynn comes uh, to bring your word to us this morning, that you would guide his words and his, um, his thoughts as he uh, exposits for us uh, this text, and just that uh, you would uh, equip him to give us a new and uh, excited zeal to keep in step with the Spirit. We love you, and it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hey, good morning, gathering. How are you? Everybody doing great? I'll tell you what, I'm so happy to hear that you guys have surge camp taking uh, off tomorrow. Uh, you, I hope you realize that across North America, the one event that takes place in most churches across North America that, that garners or harvests the biggest number of people coming to know Christ is whenever churches set aside that one week to work with children or young people, or teenagers, and express the gospel of Jesus Christ. Statistically, so many come to know Jesus on an event like this week. So this week, I'm going to ask my wife to join me in prayer for the gathering as you guys uh, go through surge week, that young people may come to clearly understand the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. So we'll do that every day, and I just want to applaud Pastor Phil for what he's been doing and leading. Uh, I've been friends with uh, the previous pastor, Garth Lino, and his wife, Patty, and family for a number of years, and, um, and I just was blessed today to hang out at the front door and shake hands with all of you. Um, the people at the border made me wear a mask when I came up to the booth, you know, but you guys didn't make me wear a mask, and I appreciate that because I, I like talking to you freely and not having any barriers between us, but it's just so good, so good to see you, and I'm glad that we can be gathered together today. Uh, the worship team chose some great music to go along with this Galatians passage that we're going to be looking at and digging out the meanings for us. And the Ibarra family, you know, thank you for the story. Thank you for the testimony because it really, it really encapsulates what we're going to be talking about today. And that is that the Holy Spirit wants to be a part of each one of our lives. Every single person, he wants to be a part of our lives. Today, if I was to have started off this message and to ask you, How many of you would like to be more attractive, uh, richer, smarter, or healthier? How many of you would have lifted your hand and said, yes, I'm in favor of all of those things? Okay, I would have too. I would have too. Guess what? I don't want to disappoint you, but we're not going to talk about all those wonderful things, all right? Um, We're not going to be talking about becoming healthier or more attractive or smarter or richer We're going to focus on what uh, Jordan read so well out of Galatians 5, and that is we want to get rid of that junk in our lives so that we can live a holier life for Almighty God. Now, here's what I want to warn you about. Some of you are going to be nervous about this because you're going to be thinking, man, he doesn't know me. I am so far from holy that I just have given up on trying to be holier. If you were to look back in the Old Testament when the Lord had instigated and developed the idea of there being this tabernacle for the people of Israel to worship in, and then the temple, all the time when they were putting together things to use in that worship environment, there were instruments and tools and materials, and God in the Hebrew language was using the word that meant holy. And it really means to be set apart for God's purpose. Honestly, isn't that what all of us want? Regardless of where we're living today, regardless of what we're doing this summer, regardless of what we've done in the past and what we are going to do in the future, it ought to be that we want to have the Holy Spirit become our training partner so that we can be more holy in our lives. 
Dads, if you've given up on the fact that you think by pattern of life and the way that you were raised that you are the grump that you have been and you will always be, listen, there's good news in the Holy Spirit. Ladies, for those of you that feel like there's this doubt about who you are and how you've been made and you envy every other woman that you look at, she seems to be smarter and more attractive and more successful and you just don't seem to be able to pull it together, guess what? The Holy Spirit has a mission for you and he wants you to be able to be who God wants you to become, not who somebody else has become in their lives. I know I don't look like it now. I'm 63 years old, pushing old man age, and I'm gonna tell you this. There used to be a time about 30 years ago when I loved lifting weights. It was one of my favorite pastimes. And, uh, and it was just, it was fun for me. And I remember when I was lifting weights, I, I, I've always been kind of a, a lone guy, exercise gym guy. Never had the big party of guys around me and everything like this. But every now and then, Pastor Phil, there'd come that moment where I'd hit the kind of like barrier on my lift. Maybe it was bench press, it was squatting, maybe it was a curl that I wanted to get up because I wanted my wife to be impressed with my biceps, you know, whatever. And uh, for her to go, wow, you're eating your breakfast and your arms really look pumped today. You know, those kind of things, you know, just to impress the woman in your life. And, and so there was times when you reached this barrier and you wanted to be able to slap on more plates on the barbell or the dumbbell, or you wanted to set the key a little bit deeper. And there were times that you just knew you couldn't jump 10 pounds or 20 pounds stronger, heavier on the bar. What I found out when I was working out by myself was that there were these little plates in the gym, 2.5 pounds. You guys have seen those, right? They're tiny things. They're not even the weight of a bag of sugar. Sugar, right? Five pounds. These are just tiny little plates. And I would take those things and I'd pick them up and I'd be stuck on the bench. Couldn't get the bar to come down and go up. I could get it down, but I couldn't get it up. And so then, I mean, it was just like mentally, I'm like, I'm blocked. I can't do it. I can't do it. And so then I'd go over and find the 2.5 pound plates and I'd come over to the bench press and what I had been able to lift 10 reps or five reps or three reps, I would take and put the 2.5 pound plates on either end, five pounds five pounds. That was it. But here's the other thing. I would find one of the guys in the gym that perhaps we'd only said like three syllables to each other. It was something like this. Hey, uh, yeah. You know, that's about it, right? But on the day that I wanted to get past that barrier, I'd go up to him and I'd say something like this. Hey, will you spot me? How many of you have done that to somebody, right? Yeah, you know what I'm talking about, right? Hey, will you spot me? And the guy's like, yeah, yeah, no problem, you know. And so he comes over there, and, and he's going to assist you because now you got 2.5 pounds on each end of the bar, and I call it the three-finger assist, okay? You know what I'm talking about. They, if they stand behind you on the bench and put, some guys do it like this, they'll put their fingers right there, or they'll put their fingers like this, like it's a, like it's a steel beam, right? And as you're pulling the bar off onto your chest and you're trying to get it up, they get over the top of your chest, and they're like this. And now this stranger who was never helping you before is standing with you with his three fingers, and he's going, you got this, man. You got this, man. You can do it. You can do it. You can do it. And so then they pretend, maybe even, like they're helping you get it up. And mentally, you're like, okay, I might not be lifting five pounds, but I'm lifting three for sure, you know? And so you're blowing, and you're spitting, and you're sputtering, and you're pushing it up. And you're like, yes, man. You jump off the bench. And the guy will say something like this to you. You did it, man. You got this. I didn't even help you. But mentally in my mind, because he was there with three fingers on either side of the bar, I just thought he was helping just enough to get it up. Here's the thing. The Holy Spirit wants to be that for you in your life today. We read Galatians 5 because all those horrible things at the beginning of the text, they sound horrible. And you're like, that's not me. But aren't they? When we hang out with people in the world today, and they could be even people in your church, and they could be people in your family, and we do nothing but talk about the lust of our life. Oh, man, I want that boat. I know I got that other one for $45,000, but I want the $65,000 boat because I just really love being on, and we rationalize why we need the bigger boat, the finer boat, the newer thing. 
Or we're out on the golf course and we're hearing everybody else talk about everything else they've been doing. And as you're playing golf, you know that you've had a great surge week. You saw seven young people give their life to Christ and a guy's talking about getting drunk and a guy's talking about this and a guy's talking about that. And you know what your whole, in your Holy Spirit heart, you're hearing something say, talk about the seven young people that gave their lives to Jesus who radically changed their lives. And what do you do? You, you're like, mm, no, not now, not now. I can't talk about it. The Holy Spirit wants us to be set apart in every domain, every corner, every aspect, every region of our lives. And we can't do it by ourselves. We can't do it by ourselves. The worship team chose a great song, and it was about being who you are in Christ is what empowers you. It's not you just trying harder, but it's Christ being in you. So today... I want to ask you as you just continue to worship with me through examining the word to look at this passage again and again and again and just ask yourself, Spirit of God, would you please pinpoint the area where I have given up and I haven't been pursuing change, but today I want you to renew that in my soul. I want you to empower me and to help me realize that I've been trying to do this by myself and I can not do it. Man, if you do that, you could walk out of this place changed in a different way today. As we look at this text today, I want you to know that it was written 20 years after Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, had been crucified, buried, resurrected, and ascended to heaven. So for about two decades, the author of this book, driven by the Holy Spirit of God, wrote these words, already experiencing what it was like for 20 years for people not necessarily to be walking in the shadow of Jesus, but instead being indwelled by the Holy Spirit of God, we're imitating Jesus Christ. And that's got to be colossal, to have the Spirit of God saying, remember what Jesus did? Remember what Jesus taught? Remember what Jesus said? Just imitate him, imitate the Father, and you can achieve much more within your life than you think you'll ever be able to do in your own life by yourself. You see, being that we're North Americans, sometimes we base everything on production or on performance. And and here's what the Bible is saying right here. Have you united yourself in such a connection with God that the presence of the Holy Spirit seems so real and so palpable at every moment that when you're at work, when you're hanging out with the new people in the neighborhood this summer, when you are going to a new place with some new people, and when you're at the old place with the other people you hang out with, that he right now has you in a new mission within your life. That's what it's saying. Because for all of us, let's just focus on the summertime. You've got circumstances that are gonna be different for these next couple of months that you've never been involved in. The Holy Spirit wants to be able to whisper to you and tell you something that he'd like for you to say or do or undertake. For some of you, perhaps you have been facing a challenge in your life that nobody else in this sanctuary knows about. And you're like, I'm just about ready to give up because I just don't feel like you're helping me, Lord. And the Holy Spirit, with his breath on the nap on the nape of your neck, has been saying, I'm here to help you. But you've got to quit doing things the way that you did it in your old way. Now that you're walking in the Spirit of God, you have to behave in a different way. You understand that? Because, you know, sometimes we can be stubborn, and whatever got us through pre-Jesus, be angry. Cast people out of your life. Don't ever talk about that again. Limit, hold grudges. Be Be involved in that one secret thing that you do because you say, Lord, look, I've volunteered for surge camp this week. You know, I do a lot of things in the church, but this 3% of my life, leave me alone about it because I'm not giving it up. And it happens. It happens to all of us. So here's what I want to know. Would you like to know how the Holy Spirit of God wants to be the training partner for every one of us so that we can be holier more set apart in our lives. Do you want to learn that today? All right, I do too. So I'll tell you what, looking at the last part of the scripture that Jordan read for us, look at the bottom text, and it's in verse 26. 
I'm reading from the uh, New Living Translation because I just use that a lot today in order to be able to share this with people who are not accustomed to reading the word. And he read it so well. But it says, let us not become conceited or provoke one another or be jealous of one another. So number one, here's a practical point on how we can be more holy and set apart in our lives. And here it is. Keep our eyes off of people. You see it up there on the screen? Keep our eyes off of people. When you're training in the gym, it's true they have mirrors. Um, and it's not so that you can look around at everybody else, but it's to make sure that you're doing the lift in the right fashion, the right way, that you won't injure yourself and you get the most out of what you're doing. In our lives, it's even dangerous for, have, for us to have mirrors. We don't need to keep looking and copying what we're doing. We need to see the Holy Spirit in front of us and hear the Holy Spirit whispering in our ears, telling us what we're supposed to be doing in our lives. So we have to keep our eyes off of other people. My wife, who has a degree in counseling, tells me that for women, that women a lot of times will look at other women and they will judge the strength of that woman by their weakness. And I said, that's amazing. Men, we're just the opposite. We look at the other guy and say, man, he may be fit, but boy, he's got a crooked nose. You know what? And I don't have a crooked nose. I said, this is kind of the way I think we are as guys. We'll find something decrepit about somebody, focus on that, and think about our strength. Women sometimes will do it the opposite way. Both are dangerous. We just need to stop looking at other people and only look at holy God. Because when we don't do look at other people, it provokes jealousy, envy, things like that. Some of us listening to the Abara testimony today could have been sitting there going, okay, Lord, why didn't you show up like that for me? Right? We could have been. We could have been sitting here going, eh, you know, I've been there. But we had to be going, praise God for the Abara family. You know, that's what we need to be doing. Because the Holy Spirit is in the process of building something up in you. And for every person from my right to my left, the Holy Spirit wants to be your training partner in the condition of where you are and the circumstance of your life, where you are and with what you've got in your life. He wants to take you one more step, 2.5 bar, you know, pounds on the barbell end with his fingers underneath. And he wants to go, baby, you got this. You got this. Just keep trying. And I'm here to help you. I'm going to spot you in this next event within your life. If you want to know what it means to be provoked, if you ever go back into the Old Testament in 1 Samuel 17, 1 Samuel 17, two men, their names are just famous. David, Goliath. David and Goliath. It says there in that context in 1 Samuel 17 that David was sent out to take a lunch to his brothers. There was a big, massive army with King Saul who were facing the other enemies across the valley. And they had just put it down to a fight of one-on-one, -on -one, mano a mano, man. It was like, just let's just face off. Let's don't go through the whole soldier thing. And so Goliath is out there, and every day he uses words in 1 Samuel 17 like he strutted, he taunted, he sneered, he roared. And it says that he was always saying, just send out your best. Send out one guy, and if that one guy defeats me, all of us as Philistines will be your slaves but if it's the other way, then you will be our slaves. And so it says for 40 days, he was out there yelling at them and screaming at them and provoking them. And, and, and here then David shows up, a shepherd boy who had beat off some lions and some bears and things like this among his flock. He was a musician. He was a creative. And all of a sudden, he puts himself out there and says, why isn't anybody facing this giant down? And so then he takes it upon himself after talking to King Saul for a little bit just to go out with nothing more than a slingshot and five stones. And what's so different in the contrast of this conversation is that Goliath kept focusing on King Saul and all the soldiers, and he never mentions God. But David comes out into this battle and this duel, and he walks up and he says, I represent the living God. And that was it. His focus was on nobody else. I'm not here in the armor of King Saul. I don't have brothers back here waiting on me, Goliath. It is only me and the living God above, and we're going to defeat you. In fact, I'm going to hand you into his hands today. Man, that's what we need to do with the things that are battling us within our lives. If there's a spiritual thing in your life that you're just saying, I can't get over this, it's because you're looking to yourself, you're looking to others, and all you need to do is look to the Holy Spirit of God. So number one, 
Keep our eyes off of people. That's what we learned in verse 26. If you would, look now at verse 25. Verse 25 says these words. It says, since we are living by the Spirit, let us follow the Spirit's leading in every part of our lives. So, number two, we need to keep our ownership off of every portion of our lives. That's step number two. Keep our ownership over every portion of our lives lives. That's hard. That's very difficult for us to do. In the New Testament, there was a man by the name of Peter. Peter, we would all say he's an activist. I mean, he was a catalyst. Uh, Frequently, Peter walking with Jesus and the disciples would say and do things, and it was like things just happened. It was like provocative and, and Rather than standing still doing nothing, something was done. But at the same time, was that not some of Peter's greatest weakness in his life? Have you ever noticed that about us? Sometimes what is that which is our greatest strength also becomes our greatest weakness or temptation. It's kind of embarrassing, but Peter was cited about his denial, even though Jesus said, Peter, you're saying you're devoted to me, but you know, real soon, you're going to deny that you even know me. And Peter's like, it will never, ever, ever happen. And yet, I can take you to four places in the New Testament. Matthew 26, Mark 14, Luke 22, John 18, where the Bible records every time in those four Gospels that he did deny knowing Jesus Christ around a campfire that night. Aren't you glad that God doesn't post yours up for everybody to read for 2,000 years? <laughs> You're great. I am so, so glad. I am so, so glad that my weakness, my arrogance, my mistakes are not posted for everybody to read for 2,000 years. And yet, in this room, there are those of us that we know we've been concealing things from those around us. We've concealed it from the pastors. We've concealed it from our best friends. And we just, we have that thing that we will not let go and we will not let the Holy Spirit take and correct in our lives. For some, it can be a bit of anger about something in the past. For some, it could be a shame that you're carrying. For some, it could be a greed that nobody else knows. But you just think that, you know, I love the Lord and I think he's gonna watch out for me, but I'm gonna keep pursuing this and pursuing this and pursuing this. For some, it could be a virtue that once that you had in your life, but now it's turned to a vice rather than a virtue. Those things that you used to push out, now you're bringing in. It could be that three, 5% of your life that once was pushed out and given under God's control, But now you become so accustomed and so comfortable. You're like, you know, my life is good. I'm living the North American dream. And so if I wouldn't be unless God was pleased with where I'm at, and God says, I would still like to have that 3 5% of your life that you keep hiding. Because you know who you are. I know who I want you to become in the Holy Spirit of God. I mean, think about what I asked earlier. Would you like to be more attractive? Would you like to be richer? Would you like to be smarter? Would you like to be healthier? If I was able to say to everyone in this room, listen, I've got the budget money to give you one of four advisors in your life to help you with those four things for a complete year, and all you gotta do is tell them when you want them, how frequently you want them, and you can just hit the goal and reach out to become more attractive, you can become richer, smarter, healthier, and I will pay the bill for one year, you probably, all of you would say, absolutely, I'll take it. But yet, we have a living God who says, I love you with all your warts and your blemishes and your imperfections and your inconsistencies. I love you, and I have this Holy Spirit of God that wants to whisper into your lives, speak into your lives, accompany in you everything that you do so that you can be reminded at every moment in the success of your business to the scrapings of the drudgery of your life that I am with you, and at every moment, just be set apart, be different, be holy, be who you can become in God. That ought to be the craving. That ought to be the hunger. That ought to be the thirst of our life. Shouldn't it? It should be. Yeah, it should be. So is there more? Oh, absolutely. Look at verse 24. Look at verse 24. It says there, it says, uh, 
In verse 24, those who belong to Christ Jesus have nailed the passions and desires of their sinful nature to his cross and crucified them there. So step number three, we have to do this. Keep crucifying the things that corrupt our lives. Keep crucifying those things that corrupt our lives. Verse 24 is a tough one. And it's the third step, and it's a hard step because there are those of us that we've seen people in our life experience who have been transformed, whose lives have been changed, who once were addicted to something in their life, and it just stopped cold turkey. A drug, a habit, a vice, a craving, a pursuit in their life, a passion for something, and all of a sudden, because they surrendered their heart and life to Jesus, has just vanished. And that's their testimony. The Lord just took it away. The Lord just took it away. The Lord just took it away. And I am blessed when I hear the stories. But do you know what I really know as a pastor, being a pastor for 20 years and serving over in two different cultures for another 13 years, 13 years together? Do you know what I really have experienced? And that is those of us who had that thing in our lives that, that, that made us feel ashamed, that seemed to be the defeat of our heart, that seemed to make us just want to surrender and say, I'm going to quit trying to strive to be something bigger than I am right now, is that most of us have to crucify it every day. Because God doesn't just make it vanish. The self-doubt, it's there. The resentment, it's there. The shame for decisions in the past that you think make you incapable of serving the Lord in rich and wonderful ways, it's still there. And somehow it just keeps coming back up. It just keeps coming back up. And and it's because rather than crucifying them with a nail so that they die upon a cross, those passions and desires, we just merely tie them down for a little while with a rope. Well, there it is. I'm not going to let that attack me anymore. And then something happens. For some, and I want to say this about us as men, sometimes the things that we do spiritually that damage our lives, we just do it because we want to indulge, or number two, we want to take a risk. It's what we do. That's why we do it. We want to take a risk or we want to indulge. For those of you, sometimes it's like life in itself just doesn't seem to be able to give you the fulfillment because you've looked at everybody else and you're jealous and you're envious and you're impatient about when is it my turn? And so then you untie that desire and passion and becomes a thing in which you can find satisfaction. And yet that's idolatry. All those ugly sins that we read about in the first part of this text, those those are all things of idolatry, passions, desires. And so they become the thing in which we try to find fulfillment rather than the living God who gave Christ for us. And after his ascension, Jesus himself said, the Holy Spirit will come and reside in you. John 14 and John 16, Jesus says, I've got to go away so that the one who comes to you will come to you and, listen to these words, never leave you. Never leave you. You cannot get rid of that training partner. You just can't, man. I mean, if I would have given you somebody to help you with your health, help you to become smarter, help you to become richer, help you to become more attractive, you know, on a lazy Saturday morning when it's training time or makeup time or it's that conference on how to do the market good in tough times, you could have said, get out of here. Isn't Tony paying for you to watch over me? Just get out of here. Hey, I'll make money tomorrow. I'll put on my makeup tomorrow before I go to church. But with the Holy Spirit, he's always Always, 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 always there. And you just got to learn to love it. You got to say, man, even when I'm an idiot, yep. Even when I disobey, yep. Even when I don't want to hear him, yep. He's always, always, always there. And he'll customize the way that he works with every one of us. That's the beauty of the Holy Spirit. Man, he's there to help us become what God knows we can become in him, setting ourselves apart to be his missionary, his minister, his servant at every moment of our lives. Would you open your Bibles to one more passage, Romans chapter 6. Romans chapter 6, I want to read this for you. It's verses 12 through 14. 
Because here's the thing, this says it better than I could say anything. It talks about the beauty of what it means just to put everything into God's hands. It says in Romans 6.12, do not let sin control the way you live. Do not give in to sinful desires. Do not let any part of your body become an instrument of evil to serve sin. Instead, give yourselves completely to God, for you were dead, but now you have new life. New life. So use your whole body as an instrument to do what is right for the glory of God. Sin is no longer your master. Some of you need to hear that today. Sin, the doubt that you have, the torment that you have, the shame that you're carrying, it is no longer your master. It is no longer your master. As in I read on there, it says, so use your whole body as an instrument to do what is right for the glory of God. Verse 14, sin is no longer your master, for you no longer live under the requirements of the law. Instead, you live under the freedom of God's grace. Man, you have been freed, so why be enslaved? The chains have been broken. Why put them back on? The darkness of shame, the darkness of embarrassment has been, ushered, has been ushered out and light has been brought into your life. Why let that ever be over you again? That's the beauty of the Holy Spirit being your training partner. But there's a fourth step, if you would. Look at this one. It comes from verses 22 through 23. And in this ver- these verses, it says these words, verses 22 through 23, but the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives. And listen to these beautiful words. Love, joy, peace. Patience, kindness, goodness. Faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Love, joy, peace. Oh, if we want those to be a part of our lives... We have to surrender to them. That's kind of weird for us. How do I surrender to something that's just an ideal, it's a concept, it's a, it's a thought, it's, a, it's an emotion, it's a, it's, a, it's a different passion and desire that I'm not naturally inclined to possess within my life? Well, we have to just give into it and let it enter our lives. I love it that in this passage, God's word says that these are the fruit of the Spirit. Have you ever been and enjoyed uh, fruit in your life? Apples, apricots, plums, you know, uh, oranges, citrus, you know, fruit is wonderful. And what's really neat is that when you're around fruit trees and when you're around the fruit, you can enjoy them because there's an aroma to them. There's a beauty to fruit trees. There's a delicious flavor when you put it into your mouth, and fruit gives you strength. These nine fruit of the Spirit do that for us spiritually. And yet some of us are going out malnutritioned to address things within our life. We're going out malnutritioned to face the community. Some of you, if you're not careful, you'll come into surge camp next week without the fruit of the Spirit filling your heart, your soul, your mind, and your spirit. And you're going to miss that opportunity where a 13-year-old young person is quizzing in his mind whether or not he thinks you all are insane talking about Jesus or he ought to really take this serious for the first moment in his life. And it will be the fruit of the spirit that will help you to be able to look at that person, see that kind of inquisitive spirit within his mind, and he's going to speak to your heart and say, just make a friend with that guy this week. It's Tuesday. See if you can be his best friend by Thursday and just say things like, hey, how are you doing? What do you think about the things you've heard this week? Mean anything to you? Do you want to talk about anything? That's the basis of the fruit of the Spirit. It's like we become one with the Spirit of God who helps us in our lives. What's even more, let me break down these nine fruit of the Spirit in three segments, okay? I'm going to have them put them up on the screen. I'll call it the triple triad or the triple dose of medicine. Here you go. When you're really, really sick, sometimes they will give you something that will take away the inflammation, something that will fight the infection that's caused you the trouble, and then also to take away some of the pain and the misery. Let me kind of look at it this way with you. Love, joy, peace. There are some theologians that said these are the regulators of the spiritual fruit within our life. That when we are with people and people are with us, that they should sense this love, joy, peace. 
Think about the number of years that you've lived with the kids that you've raised in your life. Adults, think about the time that you've been around them. There's been a lot of words gone under the bridge, right, that you've said, like water flowing under a bridge. There's been a lot of things said, a lot of things spoken. Probably your kids are not gonna remember the thousands upon 10,000s upon millions of words that you've spoken to them all their lives. But you know what they will remember? They'll remember how you made them feel. Love, joy, peace. So I call this the regulator, or I call this the setting of my thermostat. In my house, the thermostat sits in my living room right next to my recliner, and I like that. I even have a remote right now, and I could set the thermostat so that I could change it from Canada, and I could have some fun with my wife, okay? When she gets home from the church that she's going to, I could set that thing way down, which I love way down. I like the cool temperature. But what's funny about our living room is the thermostat is beside me, but the vent that pushes out the coldest air in the entire house is beside my wife's recliner. And I don't know how many times I've told her, I said, babe, let's just switch the chairs, I will sit on top of that thermostat during the summertime. I mean, upon that, that, that register, that vent during the summertime. I love the idea of sitting on top of an icebox and that air just enveloping me. I'm all in favor. She's like, no, I like looking out the window. So every summertime, we go into a negotiation phase. It's like the union of the world trying to argue with the management of the city. And I say to her, listen, let's move. She goes, no, I like looking out the window. So the thermostat goes from a sweet 68 degrees during the day up to a 69, up to a 70. Do you know where it's at today? 75 degrees. Hey, if I want to live out on the beach, man, I'll go move out on the beach, right? I mean, so, but because I love my wife, I'm setting the thermostat at 75. And so now we've even reached this decision. The thermostat doesn't go down below 70 until after 8 p.m. at night. And I'm like, oh my gosh, babe, the reason I'm tossing and turning in the bed is because it doesn't really get chilly. It's like two hours later and then I'm comfortable. So you know what? Um, Can we do it earlier? No, really, because I think it's ridiculous. It's summertime. I'm in a blanket. I'm covering up. This is silly that you're making me feel cold. And we love each other. We don't argue ugly about this. But I'm like, you know what? 75 degrees it is. So during the daytime, it's 75 degrees. And uh, I love my wife so much. I'll just put up with it. But love, joy, peace is what we should be set at when we're being led by the Holy Spirit. But here's the thing that's funny. We'll let circumstances change our thermostat setting. We'll let conditions at work change our thermostat setting. We'll let whether or not we have the progress in our life shorter than the other people around us. We'll, frustration, sadness, whatever, you could just line them up. We will set ourselves based on all these other conditions when it ought to just be simply this. This Holy Spirit of the living God of the universe, who has always been and always will be, resides in you. And you go, you know what? Love, joy, and peace. And for some of us raising adult kids and we sorrow after them, we grieve after them, we go, you know what, Lord, I could let this be a bad day today, but right now I'm just going to love, joy, peace, everything today. Love, joy. It's the setting of the thermostat. But there's that second one. I call them the responders. Patience, kindness, goodness. Patience, kindness, goodness. These are the ones where um, it, it's, it's the snap of the thermostat in my house. The temperatures have been, wow, high, right? 90s, where we're living over in Michigan. And, um, you know, there are times when I'm sitting there and I will hear the house trying to creep up above 75. And I hear, even in this digital thermostat, a snap, snap. And then you know what I hear? I hear the air conditioner kick on outside. I hear the, van, the fan underneath the house kicking on. And I know just in a few moments, the house is going to get cooler. So here's the thing. When somebody's trying to bump me off of my love, joy, peace mood, and that happens, conditions, people, things like this. If you let the Holy Spirit take control of you, he will keep you from losing it because he will give you patience kindness, and goodness. Just because somebody else has a wrong motive in the way they're treating you doesn't give us a license to go, you know what? All bets are off, baby. I'm coming after you right now. You know? No. We still are to be restrained and constrained by the Holy Spirit of God. And that's a good thing. I hate it when I have to apologize to my wife earlier in our marriage for not only having been wrong about what I said or did, but I have to say I'm sorry because of the way that I fought with her. Any other man in a room like that, you know, 
Oh, you guys are better than me then. Okay, okay, all right, no hands. Okay, Pastor Phil's the only one lifted his hand. You know, it's like, you know, it's like, I'm sorry that we fought initially because I was being stubborn and I'm sorry I said this and I'm sorry I said that and I'm sorry I walked out of the house. That's what you did in the first year of your marriage. But then you set some rules and you learn. And so these are the things. The first one is the setting of your heart. The second one is how you share to keep your life right when people are interacting with you. And the third one is the resolution. Listen to these words. Look at them. Faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Even if you're in the right, you still need to be gentle. Sometimes that's hard. Sometimes that's very hard. Looking at conditions of life. Man, I'll tell you what, that boss passed me over again. He gave that promotion or he gave that raise or he gave that person that new job that I've been wanting. I hate his guts. And I'm gonna go in on Tuesday, I'm gonna give him a piece of my mind. And he can't fire me because I'm a part of the union, whatever, okay? Guess what? The Holy Spirit of God says, listen, I don't have you here just to work your resume up. I have you here to be a missionary to the people you're working with. Is this really worth it? Is this really what you want to die on today? Because I've got you here for an entirely different purpose because you're a holy person, which means you are set apart for my purpose in this circumstance. Wow. You're sick and tired of the neighbor throwing clippings over on your edge of the yard when he deserves to pick them up and put them out at the roadside. Okay, you're right. You've got a right to speak to that person, but are you going to do it in a way that ruins your opportunity to tell them about Jesus? You see, are you set apart? So even in those times when we want to give up, we want to surrender, we want to just be who we are, the Holy Spirit of God says, no, listen, We're all working for you. Jesus Christ gave you an example. The Bible itself gives you the words and what you're supposed to follow. The Holy Spirit is monitoring you at every moment. So don't give up. Don't stop. It's the beautiful synchronized moment when the temperature is starting to rise in my house. And I look over because I know I just heard the thermostat snap beside my recliner. And I'm like, good. Oh, man, the air conditioner's on. And in my mind, I know that the air conditioning on the outside of the house is just whirled up. And I know that the fan underneath on the furnace has just started blowing. And I know that the condenser that refrigerates all the air that's going to pass over is now going to be coming out of that vent beside my wife. And it's going to rush over her body, and I'm going to start to feel cool in my house. That's synchronization, baby. I love it. And that's the way it's supposed to be with us in the Holy Spirit. If we want to be like the Holy Spirit, be like Holy God, spend time in the Word, spend time in prayer, spend time around people that act like the Holy Spirit, spend time concentrating on that, come to Surge Camp Week, volunteer, do all the things you can, because then you're showing that you're set apart for the mighty Spirit of God. And now, the fifth and final step. Look at verses 19 through 21, and I'll close rapidly. You guys have been so kind, and I know you got to set up for Surge Week. But here is verse 19 through 21. Look at the words in there. They're ugly words. They're ugly words. Uh, Some of them, you and I would say, oh, not a problem for me. I don't do that. I don't have that in me. I'm not a sorcerer. I didn't get up this morning doing witchcraft. Um, I get it. But there are some things in there that really do point to the things that we do within our lives. We put our confidence in other things rather than Almighty God. We make things in our lives the idol that is going to give us fulfillment within our lives. And it shouldn't be that way. And so what we have to do in verses 19 through 21 is we have to squeeze out the toxins of sinfulness so the Holy Spirit can train us in holiness. That's the fifth step. We have to squeeze out the toxins of sinfulness so that the Holy Spirit can train us up in holiness. Back in 1998... My wife had noticed a mole on my waistline. She said to me, you need to get that checked by a doctor. I went to see the doctor. My boy was going into football training. And so the doctor was looking at my son. I said, my wife made me promise to show you this mole. So I pulled up the edge of my shirt, showed him the mole. He rushed out of the room speaking these words. I've got to see if I've got time to take that mole off your waistline right now because that doesn't look good. I looked at my son who was 14 years old and I said, what did he just say? He says, I think he's going to take that mole off of you. And I was like, oh, oh. the room got warm all of a sudden. Obviously, the air conditioning gets stopped, you know. And uh, the doctor came back, and he said, he said, I'm sorry, I don't have time. But he said, you need to come back tomorrow. We're going to get that off, send it off for a biopsy. 
Long story short, we found out that I had stage three malignant melanoma. I'd been a missionary in Africa, that the melanoma had gotten deep within my flesh, and that later on we discovered that it transferred into the lymph glands in my left arm. And so I went through three surgeries, a year-long treatment of chemotherapy with a miserable medicine called interferon A that depressed everybody that ever took it. Fortunately for me, I'm an optimist, and so I went down, but not totally down. I was in a trial process with uh, two other young people, nearly half my age, at the University of Michigan. They had their challenges, but one of them made it and one didn't. There's a... uh, There's a hospice center near where I live now where I think about this young lady by the name of Sarah who was a single female kindergarten teacher who didn't make it, whose case was almost identical to me, but she had to stop taking the medicine because it just did weird things to her and she couldn't take it. My last day visiting Sarah at the hospice center, her body was swollen. The cancer had not only gotten through her lymph glands, but got into her brain, started shutting down the function of her body. Her eyes were swollen. Her face was swollen. She looked like basically a ball of a person inside the bed sheets, but yet she was coherent within her mind. And I would say things to her like, Sarah, we talked about this when we were in the hospital. Do you know Jesus? And she would blink her eyes twice for yes. And Sarah, is there anything that you're frightened about? She'd blink her eyes, no, I'm not frightened. So you're telling me that your confidence is still in Jesus, and can I read scripture for you? She'd blink her eyes twice. And so all these things were going on in my last days as Jamie and I were getting ready back for you know, the things that we were facing in our lives in ministry. And uh, I tell you all that, that, that battle with cancer and the victory I've had, I mean, it's never come back. It's never come back since 1998 in my life, and yet I saw it take the life of somebody half my age. And, um, and I say that to you to say this, your life is meant for something wonderful. Your life every day in every context that you live, your life with the people that you're around, your life and who you are is something that God wants to do and complete within you. And sometimes you wanna say, God, I am happy being who I am. And he's like, I get it. There was a lot of junk in your life and we fixed a lot, but guess what? There's some more things that if we just adjust some more, if you let me train you up some more, if you let me get my three fingers under the barbell, and if you put 2.5 pounds on each end, the max, the personal best that you think you've been, and that's where you're gonna stop, guess what? The Holy Spirit says, I'm gonna help you go even further and achieve more and change lives and help people in great ways that you never imagined possible. And I can do it because I'm your training partner. That's what I want for you today. The Holy Spirit of God to help each one of us become stronger in him. Would you pray with me, please? Oh, holy God, I thank you so much for the fact that you are a wonderful God who cares about each one of us. There are imperfections and blemishes in each one of us, weaknesses for which we are embarrassed and ashamed, and we're so glad that others don't know about it. But Lord, I know that you care and love each one of us. You expect and dream much more for us than we do even for ourselves. So Lord, may your Holy Spirit help us, and even in the times of this post-reflection time, this time of prayer, this time of singing, this time of just thinking, Lord, may you pinpoint that area in our lives that needs to change, and that we would squeeze out that sinfulness, because Lord, until we do, you can't replace it with good training in our lives. And so Lord, remind us too that we can't do it by ourselves, that we have to let you have total control. And so, Lord, if you would, just keep transforming the people in this community in Windsor and Essex and in the families here in this church and the community of people that they touch every day, whether it's in hospitals, businesses, private industry, Lord, that they would be your witness in a mighty way for Jesus Christ. Lord, I love the people of the gathering. I've seen miraculous things happen, not only privately in individuals' lives, but I've seen it corporately in people's lives here at this church. And so, Lord, we know that your passion, your future, your dream for this church is not ended because a pastor who helped found the church has now moved toward a new stage of his life. But, Lord, you still have desires and dreams of lives that are going to be changed. And even some of the most critical things that could be done are going to be done this week in the lives of teenagers and children here in this building. So, Lord, would you just please pinpoint in the life of every man the things that you want to change? And Lord, my prayer is that he would have the courage to change it. Lord, would you pinpoint the thing in the heart of every woman, 
every teenage girl, the doubts, the insecurities, and you can tell them, Lord, that you're going to take care of that, that you're going to make them stronger, and that they can keep crucifying those things that they think condemn them every day. And Lord, help us to just give those things to you so you can transform the world that we're in. It's a crazy world, unlike we've ever seen in our lifetime right now. A lot of hatred, a lot of strife, a lot of tension. But Lord, we're reminded of what the word says about the setting we're supposed to be living. Love, joy, peace. And then Lord, the other aspect is we're never to give up, no matter whether the conditions change, and that we persevere in those wonderful words like faithfulness and self-control. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen.